point, I would like to welcome our panelists to the virtual stage. So Anthony Kresge, Melissa Rotha, and Deepa Mehta, if you can please turn your cameras on and your microphones and join me on the virtual stage. One more, Deep Ben, there he is. Fantastic. Hello, folks. How are you doing? How are you? Good, Hello. good. Very well. Thank you very much. So, um, as mentioned, folks, the focus of the panel discussion today is the future of financial services. Can your firm compete? Obviously, priorities for 2021 are set for the most part. Um, goals around client experience, workplace of the future are taking center stage. Financial firms must begin working securely with clients and connect across departments while obviously adhering to compliance, controls, and essential worker requirements as well. So it's essentially time to make the right moves and future-proof your organization. And we're gonna dive into some of these key topics here today. And um, before we do that, I would like to introduce our panelists to you. So um, just going around from my top left all the way down, um, starting with Anthony. Anthony, if you can just let the people know who you are and where you're from. Of course, uh, nice to meet everyone. I'm Anthony Cressy, I'm VP of Business Development and Operations for Theta Lake. Theta Lake is a security compliance platform for modern collaboration tools. Uh, I come from financial services as well, so started my career in wealth management, rules, investment banking, and corporate development. Fantastic, thank you much. Melissa. Hi, hello everyone. I'm Melissa Rother. I am the financial services industry principal for Ring Central. Um, I'm tasked with kind of driving our initiatives and investments within the industry. So really here to be the voice of the customer and ensure that our product is a best fit for you all. Um, I have worked for some of the leading UC and CC companies in the past, building, building out their vertical strategy as well as have a background in financial services. So pleasure to be with you all here today. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And last, but certainly by no means least, Deepin. Yes. Uh, so my name is Deepin Mehta. I'm VP of operations at C2P Enterprises. Uh, C2P Enterprises is a holding company that has a insurance FMO, uh, RIA, as well as a, a training company and a, and a turnkey asset management program. So um, there's a lot of different moving parts uh, in our business that deal with technology. And I've also had a, had a, a long career in, in uh, you know, financial markets and, and technology as well. Fantastic, well, thank you very much, folks. Um, audience, once again, please submit your questions to our panelists using the Q&A feature or the chat box if that Q&A feature isn't um, necessarily working for you guys. What we're gonna do is obviously go through this panel discussion and then save ample time for audience Q&A at the end, as always, to make sure that all of your questions are answered and you walk away satisfied. Um, I'm going to jump right in and deepen, just kind of, kind of like uh, piggyback off your final introduction there. Opening question to yourself, very candidly, what are some of the biggest challenges your firm faced when COVID hit and how did you resolve them? Yeah, so we had a, a disconnected workforce that used phone, email, and personal communication only. So we, we went into COVID just completely blind, right? Um, so what we did was we added um, Glip Instant Messaging uh, from Ring Central. It was a really game changer. You know, everyone was starting to communicate via uh, tech, you know, text and instant messaging. Uh, we added Theta Lake, which was uh, the company that, you know, Anthony works for, uh, the, to do knowledge discovery and help our compliance team review all that new data that's coming through as people are communicating in different ways. Since we're regulated by the SEC, it was really, really important for us to have that in place. Uh, we also had a sales process that involved meeting in person and selling. You know, advisors would have seminars for their clients and then meet them personally, uh, and that had to change. We, you know, we developed uh, vir a virtual sales process that, you know, and defined tools, technologies that, that advisors needed to use to engage with clients. Everything down to the lighting in the room and the software, we kind of had to retool uh, our advisors so they could keep doing their business. So uh, it was quite, quite dra drastic what happened <laughs> as for everyone. Uh, yeah, quick follow-up <laughs> question. I mean, how, how, did, how long did that kind of process take for you to kind of get on your feet, I suppose, and make sure that you were fully functional and operational? Yeah, so it was, it was a good month uh, that, that it took. You know, we, we were kind of lucky because we had always had a need for some of these technologies. It's just that never was a priority in the company. 
you know, it was always like, we don't have the budget. We don't have, you know, it's not time. But like immediately when, you know, when this happened, we were like, let's roll all this out. We had done some research. We knew what needed to happen. So luckily we were a little bit ahead of the curve in that sense that we knew where we needed to go, but, you know, we just didn't have the reason to. And this COVID kind of pushed us in the right direction. Excellent stuff. I'm glad, glad to know that you've come through it and better off out the other end. Um, yeah. Melissa, um, I'd like to, to, to fill the next question to yourself. I mean, with all the initial challenges uh, over um, and organizations starting to settle into, I suppose, what their new normal looks like, whatever that may be for them, what are some of the new requests that you are seeing coming in from a technology standpoint? Yeah, you know, the, the new normal and whatever that, <laughs> that looks like these days. I think, you know, the, the conversations that we've had with prospects and also with current customers has definitely shifted from the standard, you know, what can you offer from a UC or a CC standpoint, but really honing into specific uh, problems or strategies that they're looking to solve for. So I think, you know, we've seen a lot, obviously, around digital channels. How are they going to engage with their clients now? Um, a lot about open platforms, making sure that, you know, the solution is more than just the one offering we have, but how is it going to work in a cohesive environment for them? And I think also partnerships or integrations is a big piece of that. You know, um, for digital channels, for example, we're working with a current customer of ours that had Ring Central prior to COVID, but with the new, new normal um, and the need to add some additional digital channels, they're looking to how do they engage with their clients from uh, a texting or SMS standpoint, right? And how do they do that compliantly? So we're really driving into those use cases like, you know, are we sending the opt-in and the opt-out message first? Um, how often is the advisor's text message have the link at the bottom to link over to their policy on their website about SMS or even retention and supervision? Um, you know, it's more than just what can you do from a UCCC standpoint, but really drilling into those use cases. Um, you know, from an integration standpoint or open platform is also CRM, right? I think everybody's kind of gone to this virtual workforce. Um, so how do they service the client kind of from a, a cohesive 360 degree view? Um, and that's being able to integrate with all their solutions. Um, so us being able to operate inside their CRM, um, you also increase, you know, garbage in, garbage out. They're getting a better, clear picture of the interaction with their client. Um, also, with the employees being remote, um, they could log into the CRM, and anyone within the company can see a clear picture of that client, the interactions, the accounts, the inquiries. Um, so we have a lot of, you know, more strategic projects that they're trying to solve for. And then, obviously, you know, the partnerships. We have a lot of requests coming in. Um, I think that's why, you know, Anthony with Theta Lake is a great partner of ours. And how do we fully support them in all their needs? And obviously, security and compliance is a big piece of that for them, too. Definitely a lovely segue, actually, to the question I wanted to kind of like fill to Anthony first, you know. Um, so I suppose, Anthony, you know, you know, with the, the, the implementation of various unified communication systems or, you know, mm -hmm. um, and tools for communication, that required a level of innovation from within a lot of companies. Um, Particularly in financial services, compliance, security is sometimes viewed as a bit of a, an innovation blocker, right? Um, when we know that obviously it can be viewed more, more like an enabler in our particular world. So how have you seen some firms, I suppose, that you've been working with overcome this view that, and, and, and get into the mindset that compliance and security can actually be an enabler as opposed to a deterrent? Yeah. Um, there's obviously challenges for financial services organizations that are subject to a myriad of regulations around business preservation and supervision of communications, electronic communications. Um, that continues to expand to all communications, whether that's collaboration chat, electronic communications and video conferencing. And so starting with that framework, when compliance, risk, legal, security all get involved in the discussions around deployment of new tools that are going to be core to their business communications, they're obviously going to want to have the same controls, both from a security perspective as well as a compliance perspective across these that they typically have in place for something like email or SMS. And where they've kind of struggled with that is those legacy tools 
are typically built for text-based communication. Maybe it's your email archive that also does flagging of words um, or some other legacy tool that you have, but it's not built for unified communications. How you actually do that across things like collaboration chat, where you can share messages as well as files, GIFs, emojis, reactions, capture all that. Also analyze audio content. Um, even when it comes to video, not only detect risk in what is shown on screen, whether it's a whiteboard, images in a background of a webcam, uh, screen share. And so having a kind of 360 review and have a compliance tool that can provide coverage for all of that is increasingly important so they can have the same compliance and supervision controls across that. So really, as they're thinking about deploying a modern collaboration tool, uh, you know, like Ring Central, where you're really enabling the workforce to be more productive because they have all these different channels that they can communicate off of, that is gonna be the new way that people are gonna work, right? Start with the chat, quickly move to a call, and then if I need to do a screen share, jump onto video meetings, you have to have collaboration or compliance tools and supervision tools that can handle all those different modalities and make sure that they're being a business enabler. So it really is looking for, and what we've built is a platform that can enable compliance teams to be much more efficient when they're doing supervision across all these different types of communications, but increasingly have the same supervision security controls across these different platforms so that they can say yes and get these things deployed to enable the organization to remain productive and even increase that productivity when they're working from home. Yeah, I love that. We've uh, actually hosted some roundtable discussions around accelerating innovation through cybersecurity and really trying to dispel this myth that, um, you know, it's the department of no. Um, touching right right uh, to the heart of it all there on how it actually can enable a lot more innovation once you know that everything is being done securely um, and you know, within the regulations that have been set out. So at this point, I want to actually uh, get a little bit of involvement from the audience going, guys. So I'm going to run a, a poll, okay? So everyone in the audience, please pay attention. I'm going to launch this poll for you now and hold this up for a few seconds. Um, the question is, what challenges have you faced in deploying unified communications? Now, this is a multiple choice question that I've put up here, guys, because understandably, a lot of these challenges, um, there isn't just necessarily one that pertains to you, a few of them may pertain to you. So I'm going to leave this up for another 10, 12, 15 seconds or so, allow as many people to uh, participate as possible. Give another five, four, three, two, one. Um, okay, fantastic. So if we just share the results there so that our panelists can also see this. So as we're seeing rocky implementation and transition, clearly, num uh, sorry, number two there, limited interoperability with other applications, the front runner. So interoperability um, and transitioning, clearly the, the key challenges, obviously low user adoption in there as well, understandably, and network and security issues, which we just kind of addressed. So some interesting insights there to understand how people have been really tackling that. Um, Deepen, taking some of this information to consideration um, as we start rounding the corner into what 2021 and beyond might look like. Talk to me about what you see as the workplace of the future. Sure. Um, so um, we see a world where it doesn't matter where you are, right? So we, we're, we're, we're seeing in our organization, um, you know, more and more uh, people kind of separated by, by, by region. I mean, it's not necessarily, nobody's all in one office. Um, so the, the tools that you use to collaborate um, are really, really important, you know, because you want to have that face-to-face -face experience with people, but you're not next to them. And, and you know, that's really uh, difficult. So... Um, you know, the future, you know, is you have the ability to meet teammates, clients, others virtually on the fly, as if you're in the same office. You know, we want to, you know, we want to increase attention to detail, as you may not be viewed at the same time that you deliver the presentation. So a lot of times you may, you may have get something set up and you wanted to communicate that to somebody, they're not available, they'll look at you maybe later in the day. And so, in terms of the quality of, of your presentation, how you implement it, it's, it's different. You're going to have to be very careful because what you've said is what they think and then they're going to act on it. So it's not like you have that back and forth where you're going to be sort of, you know, verifying things, right? So 
Um, so you'll be forced to do more follow-ups. You know, you're, you're gonna need to constantly collaborate and to get the same outcomes as if you were at work. And so those are some of the, the biggest challenges in the, in the future workspace. And, and you know, we're, we're leaning heavily on technology to do some of that, that, that would replace, you know, um, the current workplace that we had, you know. Excellent, thank you very much. Yeah, a uh, comment coming in from the member of the audience here, Francois Coach, just saying, I agree. The model in my perspective is employees will want flexibility, which will drive a hybrid model. So yeah, very, very um, apt comments there. Thank you very much. Melissa, um, how do you think cloud architecture, architecture, sorry, and you know, software as a service model better supports newly distributed and remote work workforces? Um, I think Diffin made a good point earlier about maybe some of the challenges that they had um, when transitioning to that remote workforce because uh, they might not have had the tools in place. I think, um, you know, we saw from our experience here at Ring Central that customers that had implemented Ring Central um, pre COVID and had the cloud architecture um, and SaaS model in place actually had a very somewhat smooth. Um, transition to the new remote workforce. For example, uh, Goosehead Insurance is a client of ours, and when they saw kind of the writing on the wall that they needed to send everybody home, because they were um, already a Ring Central client and heavy uh, adopters of our mobile client, they seamlessly transitioned, I think, roughly 2,200 employees pretty much overnight to work from home um, without disruption to their business and actually increased profits during that time as well. Um, you know, another example on the bank side is we have uh, AimBank, who's a customer of ours. And when I connected with them in August, I think he said the roughest challenge he had was uh, their remote users were trying to figure out how to print, right? I mean, if that's your if that's your main challenge there, I think you've got it you've got it pretty good. So I think um, COVID has kind of made it uh, apparent um, that having that cloud architecture and SaaS model in place is going to be critical and crucial to your business. Um, I think it assists with not only being able to um, kind of talk about where we, the limited interoperability, it solves for that, where that was a main um, problem, I think, in the polling, it actually solves that, right? It's the open APIs, it's the being able to have that cohesive environment. Um, also, you know, the remote workforce, we're hearing a lot about productivity. So, you know, having real-time analytics, reporting, workforce optimization, tools built into some of these solutions you're going with, you have better visibility um, to support those kind of environments. Also, I think, you know, spinning up and spinning down users, rolling out new technology too, being in sort of not an on-premise heavy, heavy um, environment and going with cloud architecture, you have the flexibility there as well. I think that's some of the top, top ones we're seeing. Thank you very much. Um, and Anthony, kind of coming back around to you as well. Uh, in your opinion, how have firms provided remote access for employees while limiting possible vulnerabilities? Yeah, I think in, in echoing some of what Melissa said, everybody's moved from on-prem. Financial services is one of those organizations coming from investment banking where everything is controlled on a corporate network. You know, I didn't have a, a laptop for my entire years in investment banking or everything is just tightly controlled. And overnight, they were really forced to move everybody onto unified communications platforms if they wanted to have any sort of business productivity. So I think that's something that was really unique in that sense. Um, some were farther along this journey, others had started thinking about it. And so I think you've really seen people in different phases, right? The digital transformation that was gonna probably take a couple of years really happened in months. And so they might be uh, a different area in how they are in that, that journey, whether it's using a tool like collaboration chat, maybe for internal, whether they're like deep in and they've started enabling using video conferencing for external facing communications. I think everybody sees that vision and is moving there. They're just on, on different phases of that and where they're going with that. But I think remote from work and how people are doing it today, it's never gonna go back in the bag. People are gonna wanna continue to use these tools. They're gonna be more comfortable with them. They're gonna continue to wanna have a balance of working at home as well as working uh, at the office. And so the only way to do that is with these unified communication collaboration tools to have them in place and also make sure that they're compliant and secure when they're doing that to enable them to comply with the, 
the policies of financial services. I think what we've seen is in some cases, companies have looked to disable certain features and functionalities if their existing compliance tools can't handle it, maybe turning off aspects of a video conferencing like whiteboarding or like the chat within a video conferencing because those are subject to certain you know, SEC 78 for books and records requirements or method to call recording requirements. Uh, but I think if you really look at it, the best firms are like CGP enterprises where they're really thinking about, this is what I want to do for my organization. I want to enable all these tools. This is how my team can be more productive. How do I have my compliance tool go fit that bill, right? And so working with us at Data Lake, it was really thinking about can we provide holistic compliance coverage so that they can be compliant with everything that they need for those requirements? And so it's taking that different view instead of trying to disable all of these things into these are what I want to use. How does my compliance vendor support all of that? Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'm going to um, throw another poll at the audience here to get some of their perspective on things. So folks, um, I do appreciate for some of the folks using the web browser version, the polling isn't working, but never fear, we'll still share results with you if you're unable to participate. So uh, poll number two is around internal collaboration. I'm gonna launch this poll for everybody now. Do you leverage internal collaboration tools to support employees and enhance team success? Yes, no, on roadmap. I will be very surprised if anyone actually answers no in this one. We'll leave that out for another 10 seconds here, folks. Let as many people, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Fantastic. Okay, share the results. As you can see, 90% say yes. 10% are obviously saying it's on their roadmap, which we can fully understand. So the overwhelming majority are obviously already leveraging internal collaboration tools to support employees and enhance team success. Fantastic. Um, moving on to another question to you here, Deepan. How are you at the moment? Um, you know, we look at collaboration tools, um, very good way as well of maintaining productivity amongst your team. So how are you guys tracking, tracking productivity amongst your teams right now? Yeah, so we, we, we kind of track a lot of things. Uh, you know, we have a weekly scorecard that we use, you know, to track identifiable metrics, you know. Um, you know, we have a defined system within each of our departments where we track the productivity. Um, for example, um, you know, our sales teams and our marketing teams, they kind of work together. Um, you know, we, we have our market te marketing teams measure, you know, the number of leads that, that, that come in and then our sales team, you know, kind of measures, you know, uh, how we take those leads and we turn them into virtual sales meetings. And then we have these, something called, we call the right fit calls where we determine whether they're going to be a good customer for us or not. Um, you know, from the right fit calls, we determine, you know, and focus on, on, on converting those, those customers, you know, and so defining that whole sales process, measuring every aspect of it, we, we really can, can look at, you know, um, how productive we are. And, and we carry that on into the operations, in, into, the, into the, all the different departments where we can see a whole, um, you know, where, where is it not working? Where is it, uh, you know, need a little bit more help, you know? And so kind of monitoring is, is the key. Um, you know, we also track internal messaging and communications um, and have increased, and that has increased dramatically in how much people are messaging us versus kind of old habits of a phone call or, or those sort of things, um, you know, and we've also created a, a task management system where, where we're able to communicate instead of emailing back and forth, you know, we're, we're, we're communicating via tasks and, and, and those sort of things where things are getting done really more efficiently and, and with, with uh, deadlines and, and set milestones. So um, I feel like you know, the more and more we measure, the better we, we, we end up performing. Most definitely. Um, Melissa, talking a little bit there about kind of internal productivity, et cetera. Um, how do you personally see the new virtual engagement and social distancing model change the way um, we interact and offer client experience? You know, 
I'm old school. I used to do open, go into a branch to open a checking account. Um, didn't like doing it online. I liked doing, um, you know, my quarterly uh, financial advisor planning in person during a lunch or even an annual, uh, you know, insurance review with my agent to talk about my policies. And it seems like uh, overnight that just went all virtual, right? And I think the organizations that could pivot um, when that happened were most likely to succeed. But I think, you know, going beyond and what's been, we keep talking about the new normal. I don't know if we're in the new normal yet, but what the new normal looks like, um, I think it's the organizations that can communicate with their clients on their channel of choice are the ones that are really going to differentiate themselves and set themselves apart from the competition. Um, kind of like in my previous um, statement about digital channels, we see a lot of increase into can we support SMS and texting? Can we do chat off of the website? Are we able to, e you know, simple email recording? Um, IVR, maybe they don't like talking in person, or, you know, it seems like everybody's getting used to video where we used to do video things and everyone had their camera off. Now everyone's got their, their camera on and we were doing video conferencing now. So I think the client experience has definitely changed. Um, and I think clients have preferences on how they want to now engage with uh, their financial advisor or agent. And so those organizations that can support all these different channels, I think, are really going to be the ones to succeed. And also, I think just on the flip side, um, you know, the client experience is going to be reflected in how the employee presents that experience to them, too. So giving your employees the right tools um, to assist them and be productive and efficient in their transactions or interactions with their clients is important as well. So I think it's definitely uh, not going to go back to how it was. There will be some sort of, you know, maybe hybrid model of some in person, but the, the definitely the virtual is where it's going to be um, and ensuring that you can support those multiple channels. Well, Anthony, in, in giving employees access to those tools, um, how do you do that with while limiting possible vulnerabilities? Yeah. Um, so there's a number of ways you can do that. It's really making sure that you do have a compliance and security uh, vendor that actually supports all of that. So as you're talking about that, and there's this fundamental shift of how people are communicating and what tools they're using. Um, again, as people are on these different journeys, you need to have a vendor that covers all of that, right? So even though it might be a point solution today where I'm just going to add chat or SMS, Maybe your existing vendor does that, but you really need to think about the roadmap and what people are looking to add into the future. So can I grow not only my unified communication deployment and enabling things like audio and enabling things like video, but can I also grow, can my existing vendor support that? Maybe it is I'm using Ring Central for my cloud PBX, but I also have uh, multiple different UC vendors in my environment, things like uh, chat from a different vendor, video conferencing from a different vendor. So not only does your existing vendor cover your existing unified communication platform, but as well as has the ability to capture and supervise communications from all the places where you're really creating content. Um, so I think you really need to look at your holistic vendor and what you have plans for, for your deployment and how is your better enabling employees. And so I think what we've seen is that not only in the very beginning, organizations were just kind of putting things in place just to make sure that they continue to keep the lights on. And so what are those tools that we, that we need to have? They're starting to become more and more strategic on that. So what does things look like in the future? They have lots more data points as Ethan talks about, and those data points are showing them that they're more effective, more productive. There's more, less cost, whether from a travel perspective or corporate office and overhead from being remote. And so because of the really think to take a second look and can we have some sort of semblance of joint work from home as well as people in the office and what does that look like in the security compliance controls and platform needs to be able to fit that model into the future and support that. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Well, and um, before I kind of throw this out to the questions that we coming into the audience and, and get them uh, for the panel, we do have one final poll. Um, which is all geared towards uh, key trends being embraced um, as we kind of, again, around the corner 2021 and start looking at the future. So launch this poll here, folks. 
what key trend does your company need to embrace? What key trend does your company need to embrace? Is that the role of artificial intelligence, the use of data analytics, digital transactions, virtual business development, or improving security in response to increased threats? What key trend does your company need to embrace? I'll leave that up for another 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Go. Okay, so having a look at these well, uh, results. So AI, obviously seeing a lot of number one, and we've seen, you know, financial services kind of typically pioneering the use of a lot of uh, advanced technology. So no, no surprise to see a lot of folks looking to try and adopt AI there. Um, data analytics, which I suppose you could kind of put within AI to a certain extent, machine learning. Um, and then security third, not far behind in third place, understandable, and then digital transactions coming in fourth. So some interesting insights there. Thank you very much to all those participating. I do love a poll because unlike when we're in a conference room and you can ask people to put their hand up, at least gives us some perspective of who's in the audience here. So um, as mentioned, guys, um, we do have some questions coming in from the audience and I wanna make sure we, we, we tackle some of these now. So first question coming in, and I believe this may have been for Deepen um, as you were just kind of answering the first question, Deepen, but Question comes in, why pay for SMS texting when free tools are available? Assume security, but what was your main reasoning? Did the messaging get tracked? Yes, yeah, so the main reasoning is, you know, actually we, we have it as part of our phone service, right? So we use Ring Central for our phone services. So this was a natural tool to extend into, into and using. Um, so it, it wasn't a kind of an add-on piece that we had to pay for. Um, so that was, that was good. And, and also, um, you know, it was, it was integrated with, with our phones and, and our, in our, in our workplace. So we knew who was on the phone and we knew who was in a meeting and, and all of those other things. So you're not, you're not constantly hitting somebody up that, that doesn't want to be hit up. Right. So, so those were one of just kind of the important, you know, reasons why we, we did that. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, another question here. One of the biggest challenges is the number of tools on the desktop. Ring Central, Skype, Avaya, whatever it may be. Um, Melissa, do can you shed any light on how some of these can combine and integrate if it's all possible? Yeah, I, I feel like I'm going to start sounding like a broken record if I keep talking about open platforms and integrations, but I really think that's, you know, where the, where the trends are going and where it's leading. And I think, you know, um, picking a vendor or a solution that can, again, give you that cohesive environment um, is key. I think I saw a stat where, you know, I forget how many hours, but like 70% of, of an agent's time is toggling between applications. So how can we cut down on that and make them more productive and efficient? And I think that's kind of, you know, where I talked about, you know, CRMs are becoming a big um, point of discussion with us and how can we put our interface within their CRM to cut down on them having to, to toggle over here to click to call there and, you know, or picking the number on the phone and how can we track the, the conversation text messages that are going on. So I think, um, you know, again, being able to pick a solution that's going to enhance and complement your environment rather than another bolt on where you just keep bolting on these solutions that don't work together and then and then what do you end up with right you know you want to make more of a cohesive environment and i think that's key with uh, the open platform and the integrations and picking the right vendor to do that for you fantastic sorry anthony i could see you nodding along quite aggressively in agreement there with melissa is there something you wanted to to add to that yeah, I think that's what we've seen as well within our existing customer base is a lot of times organizations pick different unified communication tools for specific reasons. And so you kind of start seeing a lot more where they already have an existing maybe chat tool in place, but then they're looking for something more capabilities on the cloud BBX side and they've chosen Ring Central for that and they have already have an existing vendor, maybe it's a Zoom for video conferencing. And so in each of our enterprises, we we're starting to see an average of like three to four different unified communication vendors. And I think the interoperability is increasingly important because they're specific use cases. They don't want to be jumping, opening new applications. And so as you can tie those together, which we've seen a lot of these vendors start working closer and closer together to create that, I think it starts creating this like best in class um, where you can really have the tools that you want. They can work together. It can be seamless. Um, and that's obviously what we're trying to support on the back end is 
how do you support all those different unified communication platforms from an archiving compliance supervision standpoint to be able to capture those communications. So we continue to add more and more uh, integrations for ourselves because we keep seeing the environment change where they add more and more unified communication tools. Thank you very much. Deepan, I'm going to come to you for this particular question. I think I might be able to uh, provide some great perspective here, but um, Elkin asks, in this world of the new normal, one of the challenges we're seeing is the friction points our customers and staff experience as we move across different channels, such as moving between video to SMS to online chat, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you see that changing in the future? Yeah, so we, we've, we noticed that a lot too. Um, I, feel, I feel like there's, there's training. Um, uh, there's a huge amount of training that it takes for for this to work well, um, and and you know the the amount of investment that you do put into that for your customers or your staff, it just has a huge dividend uh, because then you know when when they're actually running these these things, they're, they're actually capable of solving other people's problems, and so so like I you know one of the things was you know to get that training in place, um, you know we. We started doing, um, you know, monthly training sessions for our whole team, and there's a lot of things that, you know, would, would seem pretty obvious, uh, but everybody's at a different place. And so we, we found that, you know, bringing everybody to a common level was, was critical to, to making sure that the experience is the same. You know, the experience can be translated to our customers or, or, or even within, within how we work with each other. Cool. Um, next question I'm going to throw to everybody here because I think each of you would have perspective. So um, feel free to jump in, whomever wants to kind of take this. But um, Francois asks, what is the panelist's view on 100% remote processes to drive innovation as a permanent option? Any tips based on what you've seen? Melissa, I'm, I'm actually going to kind of throw this to you because I appreciate you kind of speak to so many different organizations, so many different sizes, industries. I know obviously you, 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 Kind of deal prominently, predominantly in the financial services industry, but Ring Central as a whole sees this. So, uh, what have you been seeing going on to like kind of think about this as a permanent fixture? Um, I, you know, I again, I'm in California, so the new normal is we're going to be virtual for a long time, and I think remote um, for quite some time. Nothing's going back to normal, so I think um, it's here to stay. Um, you know, I'm going to add to Dippin's comment too, and just the, the training aspect of it and the new models of it. Um, you know, my company uh, implemented a new, uh, it's called, I think, Wednesday Wisdom, um, where they <laughs> send some tips and tricks um, for new tools that we've implemented since being remote because we're not there. Um, but I think we're definitely going to stay in this virtual environment. And again, back to being able to um, collaborate. Um, I think it's an important part of being virtual. I think being able to service our customers virtually um, is key with it. But, you know, it's just where are we going to go and how are our clients comfortable with that? I think it's building the trust and, and getting them comfortable. And so having the right tools and resources for them um, is going to be crucial. Yeah, and to, to follow up to, to Melissa, you know, I feel, I feel like, you know, we have a lot of opportunity um, to kind of, you know, think about our, our, our physical um, sort of uh, footprint, right? When, when, whenever you're, you've got this opportunity where, where we're all virtual, we all can work virtually, like, do we actually need all that real estate, right? Like we had, we had actually had an office in Minnesota that we kind of said, all right, I don't think we need this anymore um, because our headquarters, you know, everyone's kind of all over the country, right? So it, it gives gives your workforce a lot of capability to, to do things on their on their schedule. Also, that you know they're not doing that one hour commute to work, or you know, there's there's so much so much that opens up where where you can be more productive because of 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 the way that you're allowing your your team members to work. And so I, I feel like there's 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 good and bad. Obviously, like you can't manage someone as well, right? If they're they're not there, right? You, if you're if you're you've got running a team of of, of developers, you're, you're on them. You see what they're doing. They're they're at their desk. That's there's nothing going to replace that, right? But at the end of the day, you've got the ability to to make it easier for people to work, and hopefully that that in turn you can measure and and then and then and then you know do you know understand that they're they are more productive than or not. 
you know, so. Yeah, I, I think you'll see like a lot of organizations take a, take a second look at like what processes, what teams they can really make 100% remote. And I think there's certain things like you've already saw some of it. Uh, Melissa talked about branches going into it, right? They had already started creating platforms where you can video conference with a specialist. You can walk into a branch, you can go into a room and you could video conference with a certain person. What was nice about that is you could have a specialist that would cover multiple branches or be you know, in a different geography and still have the right knowledge transferred to that person, even though they weren't face to face. Um, now that people are more comfortable with video conferencing tools and communicating this way, I think you'll increasingly see some of those things happen where like, specialist will be in different geographies you can hire the best talent and it doesn't need to be in your backyard and so i think a lot of people really take a second look now that they have some data to decide some of these things will go back to a hybrid model some of these will be completely remote or 100 percent as you talked about um despair yeah i love that comment you know um and and actually to add a, a little bit of my own two cents to that um when we've been running virtual conferences, a lot of these third party event companies are trying to recreate an in-person experience. It can't be done. So you are trying to create the best virtual experience, right? Ease of access, quality content, et cetera, et cetera. When it comes to innovation, I think the most important thing to remember is what you would once did can't be done anymore. So you need to focus on what this virtual world does allow you to do that you couldn't do previously. To Anthony's point, you can now collaborate with people around the world very, very easily without having to fly to see one another. That's one amazing point. So I think it's more about understanding what you do have that you didn't have before versus what you don't have that you did have before. And that then leads to a lot more ability to, to innovate. Um, final question I'm gonna give to you, Melissa, here, because um, this is something that you've obviously been repeating throughout the course of this, uh, of this session. And it kind of tees up nicely really for a nice close to the discussion. Carl asks, when it comes to contact centers, are financial companies moving towards two solutions or using the same UC platform for both contact center and day-to-day -day use of phones to interact with customers? And as a little bit to add to that, what I want to ask is a lot of people have been kind of piecing together kind of like this Frankenstein model, right? Where it's like, okay, we need something to do this. We need something to do that. Um, obviously, you're talking about the value of having one system that does everything, which leads nicely to this question. So talk to us a little bit about the importance of one system that does everything um, you know, use of phones, contact centers to interact with customers and beyond. Yeah, you know, we're seeing a large um, shift in that, right? I think before it was everybody had best of breed. It was like, I want this because they're good at this. I want this because they're good at that. And this is the best and this is best. And now we're going towards a model of, you know, you can have a best in breed vendor that offers all of that. Um, it's one cohesive solution. You're not running in multiple applications. You have the ability to really work as one organization and have visibility into everyone um, and also visibility into how your client's engaging. Um, I think we were talking about earlier, and I like to always say, you know, you want to future proof your investment where you might be ready and looking for maybe a new um, call center for voice and maybe chat. But going with a vendor that can also then down the road, if you're looking for a social media, you know, engagement with your clients or you're looking for an outbound campaign, ensuring that you're picking a vendor that can really service you from all areas. You may not be ready for it today, um, but I think really looking to the future and realizing that with this virtual environment, you're going to want to probably keep adding technology as you grow and picking someone that can grow with you, I think is going to be crucial. So, um, you know, it's definitely it was back in the day, let's pick all these different vendors. And I think we're more leaning towards a cohesive um, single solution vendor that can provide it all for you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, panelists. Um, that brings us to the end of the session. So if the attendees can, wherever you are, join me in a virtual round of applause for our panelists for taking the time to share their insights, experiences and expertise. We really, greatly appreciate it.